got a great show here today. This is mm-hmm. a, our guest today. You've already appeared on her podcast. Yes, I did that. I think it was, yeah, last week. Right. And we're reaching further and further. She's from South Africa. Right. And the only way that makes a difference is the damn time zone thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they I, yeah, they still have alcoholics and addicts. In South I know, Africa. different yeah. times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, the only reason I, 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 um, I, and you know this because I did this to you, but this morning at nine o'clock, I ran in the bedroom screaming and we got to go, we got to go. The podcast is now and I think I messed up on the time zone and I might have to call her and cancel. And, um, and then I kind of got my head straight and realized it was for another hour. <laughs> yeah. but it got me up and got me motivated. Oh, yes, you're up and moving. We got a lot done after that. <laughs> right, right, yeah. yeah. And our guest is also from the way of London. Um, so go ahead. Why don't you just get right into our guest today? Our guest today is Janet Garand. Is that right, Janet? Did I do that right? Oh, Perfect. Oh, good. Okay. Janet is the founder of Tribe Sober. She struggled with alcohol for many years. When she finally got sober in 2015, she decided to use her 25 years of experience in training and development to design and facilitate workshops to help others to quit drinking. Tribe Sober also offers a membership program to connect people who want to quit drinking and then go on to thrive in their alcohol-free lives. Vince, you and I um, were on her website a couple weeks ago, um, before about a month or so ago, before uh, we've, you know, scheduled this interview. And actually, Janet reached out to us, but mm-hmm. we just were examining her website and all the um, the free stuff that she has, but also the membership that she has going on on after that. Yeah, I remember that. Go oh, ahead. Yeah, why don't you bring her on? All right, Janet. How are you today? I'm great, thank you. Good, uh, very we well. Loved, we loved your website. It gave us a lot of information about you know what's going on. And so, how about you tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, sure. Well, I am a Brit, as you said. I was born in Oxford, but I spent most of my life in London until a fateful day when I decided that I wanted to go on holiday in Cape Town. So, my husband, I'm married to a French man called Vincent. Well, Vincent, as he likes to call himself. Right. So uh, we went off together on holiday in Cape Town and we both absolutely loved this place. There's just something about it. So we we loved our holiday. And then towards the end of those two weeks, we ended up just uh, looking in an estate, a real estate window and looking at these houses and thinking, oh, you know, maybe, maybe one day we could, uh, we could live here, but we are quite impulsive. And we, we were both getting to that age where, you know, we were a bit fed up with corporates. We both had a long corporate career and, you know, retirement certainly for my husband was more or less around the corner. So we just did this crazy thing and we bought a house down here, which was going to be our holiday home. So we went back and forth, back and forth. And then, uh, one day we, we just decided to move here permanently. And then my husband had retired by then, but I started consulting. I, I worked here as an HR consultant for 10 years. And yeah, so uh, married to a Frenchman. I've got a son who's 40 years old and he lives in London. And I've got a chihuahua called June. <laughs> <laughs> And that's about the extent of my my family, very small family. You know, so our audience knows, and as you know, we're here. We'd like to know about your um, connection to alcohol, because there's a very very big one there. Yeah, that's a big one. Um, So (laughs) (laughs) what started it? How did you become dependent on alcohol? You know, since the first taste of alcohol when I was about 15, 16, to me, it felt like a magic potion. You know, I was quite shy and awkward and, and I started, um, you know, my first few drinks and I thought, wow, you know, this is the answer. <laughs> and I, I just loved it. You know, you hear people say, oh, the first taste of alcohol is horrible. But for me, you know, I, I really liked it. I think it was beer or something I started on. So I always enjoyed it. And then I went away to university and, you know, everybody was drinking alcohols incredibly cheap in college and all the students, that's how they bond. So there was, you know, a lot of drinking there. And then in my 20s, I I shared a flat in London with three other ladies 
Um, we all had good jobs. I mean, I worked at the BBC and they had great jobs as well. So we were very work hard, play hard. You know, we would party quite a lot. And every evening there'd be wine in the flats. And, you know, it was no big deal. We'd always have one or two glasses. But my first, uh, I kind of divide my story into three wake up calls. So my first wake up call came at the age of 25 when uh, we were in our flat, you know, drinking, etc. We had some friends around. And the, my first memory, in fact, was of the next morning when I woke up in hospital. And I didn't know why I was in hospital. I didn't know where I was in hospital. I felt terrible. And, you know, I thought I must have had an accident or something. But what had happened was um, I'd been drinking away with great enthusiasm, obviously, and then about midnight, I'd announced to the other people there that I was tired. I was going to go to bed. So I always used to have a bath before I went to bed. So I went in the bathroom, locked the door. Um, and about 10 minutes later, 15 minutes later, one of my flatmates kind of banged on the door just to say good night. And there was no reply. And then, you know, some of the others came and they were hammering on the door. There was no reply at all. And they'd seen, you know, how drunk I was. So they started getting very anxious. So they rang um, the emergency services and explained. So they sent along the fire brigade and the, the medics and they knocked the door down. And, you know, I was under the water and I was pretty much unconscious. So they had to revive me and take me up to hospital. So I think that was my first warning sign that, you know, I had an issue. But I just brushed it off, you know, rather rather than thinking, well, that was weird. I really should talk to someone about this. <laughs> we just laughed about it. You know, my friends would say, oh, did you hear about Janet in her bath? What an idiot. And it was it just became a bit of a legend. Yeah. So that just carried on and carried on working hard, playing hard. And then when I was 30, I got married to my first husband, who uh, was also a very enthusiastic drinker. So, um, you know, we had the kind of marriage where we both we'd get home from work. We'd have a shot of Jack Daniels. We'd have wine with dinner. And it was perfectly normal. All of our friends were exactly the same. We'd have dinner parties at the weekend that went on till three o'clock in the morning, you know, bottles and bottles of wine. And um, in my early 30s, um, I got pregnant with my son and I managed to stop drinking for nine months, but I really white knuckled it, you know, and I hated it and I couldn't wait <laughs> for the baby to be born. Mm. So this carried on uh, this life, which was a very nice life. You know, uh, we, we thought we were living the good life and we were in a way. And I always say to people, drinking's great fun until it's not, you know, until it turns into something a bit darker. So in my 40s, I got divorced and remarried to the French man. And that's when trouble started, really, because um, the French don't drink like the British. You know, they're, they're rather more sophisticated and they drink for the taste and they'll drink more with food than just going out for drinks like we do. And he was rather horrified at the amount that I was drinking. You know, he couldn't believe that I drank every night and that I would be putting away at least a bottle of, of wine and that sometimes I would kind of black out a, a little bit. And, um, you know, he, he used to lecture me and he said, oh, you know, you're drinking too much. It's not good for your health. And I'm a bit of a rebel and I don't like being told what to do. So in a way it made me worse. Right. But um, I knew... That, that there was an ultimatum coming and I wanted to stay with this guy. So I tried. And for the first time in my life, I tried to cut down. I mean, the thought of completely stopping was, was just <laughs> not acceptable. I couldn't imagine a life without alcohol. So I looked up the safe limits of alcohol and it's something ridiculous, like a bottle and a half of wine a week. And I was drinking that every night, but I tried very hard, you know, and I would write down how many units I'd drunk and, you know, maybe I could manage for a week, two weeks, and then the wheels would come off and I'd drink till I blacked out and then we'd have a huge row. And it, I was just stuck in this kind of groundhog day going round and round and round. And this went on for years. And then in my 50s, I got breast cancer. And we, we know now that the link between alcohol and breast cancer is pretty well documented. But at the time, you know, I was in denial 
And, uh, yeah, I went through mastectomy, chemotherapy, a whole year of, of hectic treatment. But I was I was still drinking. It didn't really occur to me to stop. I think at one point I changed from white wine to red wine because I'd read somewhere that red wine was good for you. <laughs> of course, I know. I know now it's not, but in those yeah. days. So carried on. And then finally I had my wake up call at the grand old age of 63, would you believe? And that happened when I was away with a bunch of friends. There were about 10 of us. We were in this beautiful house on the West Coast that we'd rented for the weekend. And they were all pretty boozy people, apart from my poor husband, long-suffering husband, still around amazingly. Yes. So, um, you know, there we were on the bubbly at um, breakfast time on Saturday, drinking all day long. Sunday morning, I woke up feeling terrible but kind of staggered to the breakfast table pretending that I was fine and then I said um, at some point in this chirpy voice I said oh let's walk to the next village because there's there's a nice house there maybe we can rent that next time we come this way and I'll always remember there was a kind of hush and they looked at me and they said uh, Janet we went there yesterday and you were with us and you were walking okay and you were talking you seemed absolutely normal so I'd had a kind of walking talking blackout right. and for some reason that really frightened me because I, I think I knew that I was harming my body you know I got the breast cancer to prove it but uh the thought that I was harming my brain, you know, and getting a bit older as well, I thought, you know, I'm just destroying myself. And why? You know, there's no excuse for this because I'm very blessed. You know, I've got a nice life. Why am I destroying myself? So then the Monday after that weekend, I said to my husband, that's it. I'm done with alcohol. And to be fair to him, rather than saying, oh, I've heard that before. He said, oh, you've never said that before. You always say I'm going to cut down. So that was a real turning point. But of course, the problem then was how, how on earth am I going to do this? So, of course, I trotted off to AA because I didn't know what else to do. And I tried a few different meetings, but I just couldn't kind of find my people. The meetings I went to, they were very kind of male orientated and, and the guys there, were, were quite far down the line. You know, I've, I always felt like a bit of a lightweight compared with them with my bottle of wine at night, you know, and they were on the spirits when they woke up kind of thing. So I struggled to find the people and there were too many rules as well. I, I didn't, I objected to labeling myself an alcoholic, although no doubt I was, but I just don't like labels. Yeah. So it just wasn't working for me. So I carried on looking and eventually I found a workshop in London and it was just a one day workshop and it was nothing special. You know, they, uh, it was a nurse running it and she explained to us what the alcohol is doing to our body. She, she worked in a last stage kind of liver disease ward. So she was showing us all these pictures and, you know, she took us through what it does to your health. So I was quite shocked at that because I had no idea quite how bad it was. And then she uh, gave us some tools to help us to change our behavior. But the main thing was that I found my people, you know, they were all women there and they all had good jobs and nice families and were drinking a bottle of wine a night. And they were, you know, 40s, 50s, and they knew it wasn't sustainable and it was bad for their health. So um, I connected with them. We all swapped numbers. I came back to South Africa and I just uh, haven't had a drink since. And um, after I'd been sober for almost a year, I'd, I'd retired by then and I was loving my sobriety so much. And I thought, I think I can design a workshop for people here, you know, because all people have here is AA. There was nothing else seven years, eight years ago. So I designed a workshop and people came and they came to the workshops and then they, they said they wanted more content. They wanted to stay connected. So then I did the, um, I, d I did the uh, membership and then um, 
I was an executive coach anyway uh, from my corporate days. So I retrained as a recovery coach and then we took on a couple of recovery coaches. So that's how Tribe Sober was born. So I'm seven years sober in May and it's the best thing I ever did. You know, I feel like I've been given a, a second lease of life, really. And the work that I do, as you know, because you do it as well, it's just so rewarding. I feel like I found my purpose for the first time. Mm hmm. That, yes. that was me too. I, um, I I had lost my son and was roaming around without purpose. And when I got sober, 10 days sober, I was like, okay, I, I, now I know what I need to be doing, you know? So it's just amazing. Well, I'm glad you found that. But what about fun? I've heard a lot of people that once they quit drinking and stuff, it's like, what am I going to do now for fun? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to die of boredom, you know? So how did that work out for you janet that whole yeah that that's a big one and to be perfectly honest i did go through a period of depression really in my early sobriety i think months three four and five i was really down and i was kind of thinking well what now you know is is this the rest of my life is it going to be this gray dull boring place but then you know things got a lot better and I interviewed uh, a neuroscientist for the podcast a while ago. She's written a book called The Happy Brain. And she explained to me um, that that period of being down, which many, many people go through, uh, as I'm sure you know, what it means is um, because when we first decide to get sober, our brain thinks, OK, you know, we've got a project, we're going to get sober. And then after two or three months, it says, OK, you know, we've done that. What now? And as this lady explained to me, our brains need projects. You know, it goes back to the cavemen, how they got up and they would have to go and get food and then they'd eat it and they'd have to get more food. So if we want to keep our happy brain chemicals so that dopamine uh, triggered, then we need a project. And she kind of analyzed what had happened to me because I'd, I'd had this down period. And then I'd got this idea to create Tribe Sober. And then, you know, there was no stopping me because I had to learn marketing. I had to learn to create a website. I had to, you know, do all this stuff and it kept me busy. And it had lots of kind of mini goals on the way to creating this, this major goal. And, you know, that's, that's what people need. And we always say to people in our community when they start saying, oh, you know, I'm not drinking, but I'm a bit fed up, don't know what to do for fun. We say just get a project, you know, try lots of things. And, you know, in our membership, we have lots of things to try and help them to find new interests because in a way we have to reconfigure our life don't we we can't just have the same life without alcohol in it or we'll always feel there's something missing so we have to recreate our life and um, you know we offer things like yoga classes and art therapy because we want people to discover what they really love doing because if we've been drinking for decades like I was we actually don't know what we do like doing apart from hanging out with our friends and drinking but uh, sometimes we have to go back to childhood almost but you know i've discovered that i love writing and you know i'm actually quite a, quite an introvert i've discovered where I, as i always thought i was a party animal <laughs> so i love being on my own and reading books these days but it might be part of being older <laughs> I love that idea of our brains need projects. And, and as you were saying that, it was just hitting to my own life. Um, I started drinking at the end of getting my degree. I was, I, I had, a, I would say I had a 10 year list, 10 year list, 10 year plan with the list. And I checked everything off of the list. And, and I said, okay, now what I had no, I had no purpose. I had nothing to do. Yeah. I didn't even know what to do. And, um, that's when I started drinking and there were a lot of other things. I don't think that was just it, but yeah. And when I got sober within 10 days, I already had a project and I didn't yeah. have, I didn't struggle at all with sobriety. I didn't have the depression. I actually yeah. think I feel it more now because I'm stressed out about trying to get the project's done, you know, but um, yeah, yeah. Have any then? But yeah. I say to people, kind of, because uh, it, it it is a flatness. Some people call it a void, and I say, can welcome it. You have to welcome it and sit with it. Don't try and chase it away with booze, because that's when the magic happens. You know, that's when your creativity will come back and you'll start having ideas. If you don't make sobriety 
more fun, more contentment, full of more purpose than you're drinking. It's just going to mm -hmm. be the natural tendency to return to drinking and drugging. That's exactly. the challenge really is to get on with it. Yeah, I mean, it's in I'm, two stages, isn't it? First of all, we have to stop drinking and then we have to go into recovery and rebuild our lives. It's so important that we realize that not drink, we want to think not drinking and drugging is the finish line. And it's not even the starting line. It, it's just a return to neutral. And, and when we do what you talked about doing, finding purpose, finding contentment, finding joy, that's the starting line. And that's the rest of the life. And if you don't ever do nothing but stop drinking, it's not fun. Janet, I wanted to ask you as you were telling your story um, about something that struck me we have a friend who's in recovery um, who's dealing with breast cancer um, at the moment she's in recovery um, and has a good program but what would you say to her about that um yeah i mean i uh these days when i go for my annual mammograms i'm still scared right. but i think even if it does come back i mean we can never guarantee it won't come back but i think even if it does come back at least I can, I have peace of mind that I did everything that I could. Whereas, you know, once I realized that alcohol and breast cancer were linked and I was still drinking, it used to double the, the fear somehow because I thought, well, you're bringing this on yourself. And um, yeah, I mean, I would say to her, just, you know, get, get as healthy as you can, you know, exercise like mad, drink lots of water, stay away from alcohol, mm -hmm. which uh, as apparently you, you probably know this, but in 1988, the World Health Organization announced that alcohol was a carcinogen. So, you know, it's so scandalous that the, this information is not in the public domain. You know, it's only just gradually creeping out. It's like cigarettes. You know, I used to smoke in my 20s. You know, I worked in an open plan office. We were all smoking. It's mad. You know, we had no idea it was bad for us because in those days, um, cigarette advertising was allowed. You would see doctors in their white coats, you know, advertising it. And then one day they they banned alcohol advertising and suddenly it was in all the press, you know, smoking gives you lung cancer. And I still remember my friends and I reading this and saying, oh, my God, you know, I'm going to stop smoking. Right. So I think one day, I mean, I sadly probably won't live to see it, but that'll happen with alcohol, I'm sure, you know. They um, also in that the, the alcohol increases estrogen. Oh, yeah. And I had that kind of breast cancer. I don't know about your friend, but we've got yeah. loads of people in our community that have had breast cancer and it's all the estrogen linked. Mm -hmm. did, did How did you talk to your doctor about your drinking as you were going through this? Were you completely honest? <laughs> well, no, that's that. I mean, alcohol was not mentioned at all. You know, I was busy. I mean, I have to say when I was going through chemo, I was in a such a state. I certainly wasn't knocking back a bottle a night, but I was, you know, still having a drink now and again. I remember saying, oh, I can't even enjoy my wine anymore. But um, at the end of that, I mean, this was back in 2006. So I said to my oncologist when he kind of signed me off as much as I can, you know, he said, OK, your chemo's finished. Everything's finished. Look after yourself. And I said, so what about my my diet? You know, should I be eating organic? Should I avoid alcohol? Because obviously I was hoping, you know, he wouldn't say yes, avoid alcohol. But I thought even if he did, you know, I will because I can't yeah. stand going through all this again. But he, he didn't. He just said, oh, you've been through, you know, a lot of pain this last year. and But you've survived and you're strong now and you must uh, enjoy your life now you must eat drink and be merry mm -hmm. and of course to a dependent drinker you know that's carte blanche to go back to my uh, <laughs> bottle and a half of wine a night <laughs> but the poor guy you know i don't want to blame him because he probably meant you know have a glass of wine a week or something <laughs> so you know he uh, he didn't um didn't say anything, but uh, I've got a, a friend in that situation and she went for her checkup the other day 
And she was given, this was in the UK, she was given this sheet of guidance and it said, uh, alcohol, do not drink more than three small glasses a week. Mm -hmm. So at least they mention it now and they're right. talking about quantities. Right. So, um, yeah, I mean, again, the information is finally getting out there. I know. I, I Last time I talked to a doctor about it, um, you know, I, I lied. I, I, I was more honest than I'd ever been in my entire life, and I still lied. I told them about seven a week, what, which does not add up because it was three a night. <laughs> you know, the math, <laughs> well, my math is bad, <laughs> but it's not really that bad. Yeah, and so, yeah, I was curious about how, um, how you approach that with the breast cancer. Yeah, well, nobody asked me yeah. if I drank alcohol. Yeah. My first drink of the night was three small glasses at least. Yeah, no, you just <laughs> get you going, doesn't it? That, that was with, with me. I say to people, I could never moderate because for me, um, you know, a bottle and a half of wine a week, it's just not enough. You know, it right. doesn't do anything for me. So I would rather have nothing at all. Right. And, and I think people are crazy, you know, when they waste, just as I did, actually, I wasted a decade trying to moderate because it's so much easier just not to have a drink. And then we have people, you know, we obviously we warn them about this, but if they've been sober for three months, maybe six months, they think, oh, I'm all right now. You know, I'll have a bottle, I'll have a glass of wine now and again. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we can't uh, <laughs> forbid them. So they go off and they do it sometimes. And then and they leave us. And then about three months later, they're back, you know, and they say, well, you were right, actually. Yeah. <laughs> I've gone right back to square one. Because once we've crossed a line, there's no going back. You've just got to go forward and, and ditch the stuff and create a new life. You know, yeah. we spend so much time trying to moderate, trying to control our drinking. If we put, invested that much time, oh. you know, into, into helping others, into achieving our goals, where would we be? There's just so much we could do. Yeah, it's think, exhausting you know, and it fills up all that mental space. You know, how many units have I had this week? And, oh, I really shouldn't. And then, oh, I did. <laughs> you know, if you got a problem with drinking and you can moderate, that's good. And I tell people, if you can do that, go for it. That, you know, and there are some people that run into a problem and moderate. But there are those of us out there that moderation just doesn't work. Of course, what I love what you said about they come and try for you a little bit and then leave and then come back. In the 12-step rooms I'm in, I, we, we like to say a little bit of 12-step work is a terrible thing because it'll ruin your drinking. Once you run mm -hmm. into this concept that if I drink a drink, my foot's on the banana peel and boom, I'm gone and I've lost control. Yeah. But as long as I stay away from that first drink, I'm great. But we got a mind that returns us there over and over again. So, yeah. yeah, and I think another thing that happens to us after three to six months is uh, we forget how bad we were. You know, we think, oh, well, maybe I wasn't that bad. And uh, so we recommend that people write a goodbye to alcohol letter as if it's an abusive lover, you know, and, and quite a short letter saying, you know, all these hate things happened when we were together and they're not acceptable and it's over. And then, you know, if you can read something like that, or if you make a list of all the things that went wrong when you were drinking, yeah. because uh, I mean, I always say that things didn't go wrong every time I drank, but every time things <laughs> went wrong, alcohol was involved, yeah, you know, it's, now you it have on YouTube, some of those letters, don't you? Um, they're certainly on our website, yeah. Oh, are they? I think, yeah, I read it out actually on the radio here. It was quite interesting. And uh, lots of people then started emailing me their goodbye to alcohol letters or goodbye to drugs or it was goodbye uh -huh. to a person. So that was really nice. And yeah, we've got them all on our website. Yeah, one of the things that I do when I'm working with some of my new people in, uh, in alcoholic, I get them to do uh, draw a line down a piece of paper on the left hand side everything that it costs them you know drugs families money all that stuff and then on the right hand side write down everything that it brought of lasting value and usually yeah. the right hand side is blank and the left hand side and kind of do that to yeah. do what you just did try to move them beyond because in spite of how full the left hand side is you know doesn't stop us and we do fear stopping because we think we're going to lose so much, but we gain so much once we get to a certain point and we can look back objectively. Right. You being a coach and a teacher and stuff, you mentioned that you get them to write a letter. Have you found that, you know, 
I think we talk our way back to health. We do a whole bunch of stuff, but there's something magic about putting that pencil to paper. Have you found that in your stuff, your skills and stuff that you do with your? So yes, yes. And, and in fact, my, uh, my last podcast, the one that came out on Saturday, not I've got a little one that came out today, but on Saturday, I'm interviewing um, this. Uh, she, she's a kind of local public figure here. She's very well known here. And um, but at her rock bottom, she was a, a heroin addict living on the streets. And anyway, she got clean and she wrote a book um, called Smacked, which is a bestseller. She went on to write more books. And, and now she's a writing teacher and she's a journalist. I mean, she's an amazing woman. So interesting. And uh, she talks about writing and the healing, um, you know, nature of writing. And she said, what we have to do when we're in recovery is we have to meet ourselves on the page, you know, and magic happens when we start writing about ourselves. And it, she said, it's more powerful than speaking, you know, just writing it all down. And uh, I thought that was beautiful. And she said, the, the more that you write, the more that your secret self will emerge. And I mean, I love to write as well, but she's, she's brilliant. And she does online courses, you know, via Zoom. Let us know what um, your members get when they join Tribe Sober. Okay. Well, the first thing they get, because we're, we're quite small, we keep it quite small on purpose we don't because we've got there's memberships uh there's one in in england called they only started a couple of years ago they've just thrown a lot of money into it and it's called one year no beer and they've got one hundred and eighty thousand members <laughs> and they're very proud of this so they're always yeah. talking about it but you know we, we go at it from another angle because we want to provide a personal service so we've we've got 350 members and we're not really planning to grow it much more so when they join the first thing they get is um i've got a colleague called sue who actually got sober with aa she's been sober about seven years and she they so they have a chat with sue so they have an hour with her on zoom and they tell her everything you know about their drinking and then she designs a program for them because we've got a seven step program we haven't got 12 steps but we've got seven <laughs> so we have you know our first step is to get connected so sue for example every day she does a zoom call and you know she'll get maybe three or four people on that call so every day you can do that and of course we've got whatsapp and slack group so people are chatting all day long and because we've got quite a lot of American uh, members these days, the it's going 24-7, you know, the time zones are covered. Yeah. So we get people connected and then we, we want them to get prepared. We want them to learn, you know, because I really believe that the more we understand about alcohol, the less likely we are to want to kind of pour it down our necks. So we recommend, you know, maybe that they try a workshop as part of their membership. We've got um, a bookshop on our website which is connected to Amazon with all the quitlet. We've got lots of exercises and, and articles in there. And then, uh, you know, we say the next step after you've done this prep is to do the work. So, you know, that's... Um, as you as you very well know, we can't just sit there and waiting waiting for it all to happen. So we really recommend that they they start exploring and reconfiguring their life and finding new connections. And of course, you know the joy of of a sober community is we we've got connections and there's we've got ready made friends out there. And and I love the you know the connection in the recovery movement whether it's aa or what we do and i find that with podcasting and i'm sure you do right. you know you, you just meet somebody that's been through what you've been through and you can um you know they're like your best friend within five ten minutes rather than a stranger that you're still trying to figure out we've got this deep bond i think because we've been through the same thing so, um, yeah, we, we, we get them to do the work and then we've got a doctor that will give medical advice. We have sober buddies, which is quite nice. It's a bit like the sponsor in AA. It's people that have got sober with us. They've been uh, sober for about eight months, nine months, and they just want to help someone else. You know, they're not qualified coaches or counsellors, but they're someone that will message you, you know, or people can have coaching or they can go to our yoga class that we have online yoga classes 
We've got a hypnotherapist who um, offers one free session to see if people like it, and lots of people like it. We've got a nutritionist that will consult, and we've got the Happy Brain Coaching because we loved our podcast guest so much, Loretta Bruining, that uh, one of our recovery coaches went on a course that she Loretta was running called Happy Brain Coaching. So um, we can now offer that as part of our offering. And then we suggest that people write this goodbye letter. And then we, we've also got things like art therapy, root cause therapy, because we, we talk a lot about those limiting beliefs that people have that we all had when we were drinking. You know, well, I need to drink to have fun, to relax, you know, to connect with other people. What will happen without it? So, you know, we, we talk a lot about mindset and limiting beliefs. Um, we're all great fans of Annie Grace, you know, from uh, the US. I'm sure you know her. So uh, we, we recommend that book, The Naked Mind. Absolutely. I love her. I've learned so much from her. Me too. I ask because, you know, a lot of uh, about the Tribe Sober, a lot of um, people up to this year i mean i thought of memberships as netflix you get on the computer turn on the movie you want to watch and that's it and i think it's really important that people who are in recovery know that there's a lot going on in some of these memberships yeah and and um yours has quite a bit going on some have a lot less some are a little more intimate some are a lot less intimate and it's really important to you know take a look at 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 a bunch of them and find out what works for you you know yeah, I mean, ours actually came about because um, people that came on the workshops, we've run about, I counted them the other day, 75 workshops now. And people that were coming on the workshops, they say, oh, this is great, you know, and I met these really nice people, but I want to keep in touch and I want to keep learning things. And of course, you know, we, we want to keep them sober. So it, it works perfectly if you're offering some kind of training as well. And it doesn't have to be an either or. You know, no. I, I attend a um, 12 step program. I go online and get smart recovery online for myself. I have been with therapists. Um, I, you know, I mean, I, I get a little bit of everything I need from all these different places. And, and, yeah. and of course, you know, I help people. So yeah, that's great. Yeah. You have all that. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's the modern recovery movement, isn't it? You know, yeah. one size doesn't fit all either. No, I think no. That, 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 that's very important. And the more of these that we can do, it's fine. Some people find that, you know, that only works in a face-to-face -face environment. But one of the things that's really come out of the pandemic is this whole world of the digital world where you meet yeah. like we're yeah. meeting right here. And the thing that I love, because Gina and I are trying to roll out a, a, a membership website. We're in the middle of that now, um, now Sober Academy, and we're focusing on families. So you find what makes you what makes sense to you, the people, the organizations, the classes and stuff that makes sense for you and go for that, you know? And it sounds like Tribe Sober has got uh, you know, a lot of great stuff together that people can plug into that can get help that might make sense for them. Yeah, well, we love the way it's quite international now because when I started it, I was just running workshops, physical workshops, obviously, six years ago in Cape Town. And I never really thought it would go much bigger than that. And then uh, somebody said, well, go to Joburg. You know, I kept getting, uh, that's the other main city here. People kept asking me, so I went there. And then I decided to go back and do one in London because I was going there on holiday. And then obviously, you know, with the pandemic. But if someone had said to me, why don't you do your workshops online? I'd go, oh, no, they won't work online, but yeah. they're absolutely yeah. fine. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I remember at the beginning of the physical workshops, um, you know, we asked people to share their stories. And, you know, it's quite emotional, obviously, most of the time. And, you know, people are crying and people are hugging. And I thought, well, how's that going to work on Zoom? But you know, it does. People are just as open and vulnerable and people are just as kind. And, yeah, even our, our hypnotherapist, uh, she tells me that the it works so well on Zoom because people are, are more relaxed because they're in their own home. And she said it takes at least 15 minutes off that time that normally it would take them to relax and settle in her home. So it's the online world is, is really getting very interesting. Well, is there anything else you wanted to add, Janet? 
Um, no, it's, it's been a, a pleasure talking to you. If anybody would like to know more about Tribe Sober, then um, they just go to tribesober.com. Everything's on there. And of course, we have our uh, weekly podcast, which is also called Tribe Sober. And we've got our hundredth uh, episode coming out on Wednesday. <laughs> so there's a, a lot of podcasts out there but i love podcasting i wasn't sure i was going to stick at it when i started because i thought oh this is a lot a lot of work you know finding people talking editing but i've just met so many awesome people and learned so much myself that i'm going to carry on i'm in it for the long haul (laughs) we've reached a point where we don't have to chase people down you know yeah yeah i mean we still once in a while we'll get in a little slump but we get it's become so much easier now that we got people who want to be on and who you know are respecting yeah. what we do but i also want to add that you have a great youtube channel i was digging through that and there's a lot of information on the youtube channel and um, um so i will put the link to your website to the podcast and to the youtube channel in the show notes so thank you very much you can go and I, i've just started on tiktok <laughs> oh did you no oh, really oh okay. now i'm gonna have to look for it <laughs> Yeah, I think I, I'm the oldest person on TikTok. No, <laughs> no, but you know what? Even even if you were, you you've got a young heart. If, you know, when you were talking about, <laughs> I did this at this age, and I did this at this, age, and I'm thinking, well, she she no, there's no way. <laughs> so um, you you do fine. You'll do fine. I gotta go check it out. I'm excited. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Please follow me. I've only got about forty <laughs> followers. It's embarrassing. <laughs> I don't. I don't think being forty nine years old is too uh, old to be on tiktok janet so. <laughs> 49 <laughs> <now> i wish <laughs> <laughs> me too <laughs> me too it, uh, that's awesome i'm so excited and I, I agree with you we have met some of the neatest people and made some real good friends and and, and people that uh, believe in us and and do whatever they can to help and we certainly want to offer the same thing to you whatever we can do to help and uh we're all part of it, so you're about ready, sweetie. I'm about ready. We love talking to you, Janet, and um, I look forward to doing it again sometime. Cool. Let's stay in touch. Absolutely, absolutely. I, I get to say I have a friend from South Africa. <laughs> we have and, a couple, but but yeah. And if you go to our website and it looks just like yours, uh, don't call the lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> And what do they say? Imitation is the highest form of flattery. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you, Janet. Bye-bye. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye.